Um, Cameron is um, at Trace Diaz, as you all know, and so a lot of the men are gone. And so you're going to get me this morning, and it's an honor to, um, to be able to stand and share. And I'm going to do the best that I can. I have prayed myself in this week, and I think that I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, now, the other thing is, uh, just, just a side note, you might um, remember that the next time I'm out, Cameron and Willie said they were going to sing. So that'll be quite a treat. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I can do, <laughs> hopefully I'll, I'll do the honor to the Lord this morning. So um, let's just pray. Father God, I just come into your presence this morning, Lord Jesus, and I pray, Lord, that you would just take, take this morning, Lord, that you would take every word that comes out of my mouth, Lord, that you would be glorified this morning, that your spirit would move mighty among this place, Lord. I pray that you would bless and heal and, and just, just show up. Father, show us your glory this morning and, um, and be with all the men that are at Tra Trace Diaz. Father, I pray today that, um, that, again, your glory, I know it's all over that place. So we give you the praise and the honor, and everyone said amen. amen. So I have my notes, and, and, uh, and I may be reading a lot. We're going to do a lot of scripture, um, so a little different than Cameron. But anyway, we're going to be talking about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And this morning we were singing, the Word's name is Jesus. And so this morning we're going to talk about what it is to be a warrior and the battles that, that we sometimes face and go through. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about is that a warrior is, a, is trained. They know what their weapons are, and they know what they are, they know how to use them. And a warrior also knows who they are. They know who they're fighting for and what they stand for. So in Ephesians 6, 17, it says this. We've been talking. It says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So over the past few weeks, we've been talking about all the different parts of the armor and how Paul had referred it to a first century Roman soldier because that's what he knew. That, that was his time. That's what he knew. And so, so far, all the pieces that we've been talking about are defensive, meaning that we're protected by them. And with them, we're able to withstand everything that the enemy could throw at us. So to this point, if we had every piece that we've talked about, the Word of God says that we'll be able to stand against the attacks that the enemy has on your life. But what I was thinking about, the cool thing about that is, is God even gives us more than that. Because God wants us to not just scare the enemy, God wants us to send the devil running for his life, and not to just withstand his attacks. Amen? So we've talked about the belt of truth. Belt of truth. Everybody put your belt on. The breastplate of righteousness. Not our righteousness, but God's. And uh, I was remembering Rich Mullins. He, he uh, wrote the song, uh, Our God is an Awesome God. I don't know if you're, you're old. Anyway, I love him. And one of the things that he said is he said, you know, we're not good. We're not saved because we're good. We're good because we're saved. And we never, ever can forget what Jesus did for us. And we can't take it lightly what it cost him. And we should never assume that because it cost him his life, that it's not going to cost us ours. Because Jesus gave his life for us, and it cost him everything. So we, just, just a reminder, we should never, ever think that it's not going to cost us something. So third is the shoes of peace. And we have to choose to walk in peace. Sometimes that's hard for me. I don't know about you. We have to choose to walk in the shoes of peace. We have to take up the shield of the faith. That shield of faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as your faith increases, your shield will be stronger and you'll be able to extinguish every fiery, mean, horrible dart that'll come at you. And then the helmet of salvation we have to fill our minds with God's word, and we have to fill our minds with the hope of things that he has to come for us. And I don't know about you, but this week, Trace Diaz weeks are always really hard, I think, on a lot of people. And this, the, since Cameron's been gone, you know, I've just been having to remind myself to just protect my mind because the enemy's just attacking me with these thoughts. And it's just like we have to remember to, to, to really put that on and, and protect our mind. And... What we're going to talk about today is taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. 
So we are to be trained in the word. Because if you're an untrained warrior, you're not a threat. You don't know what you're doing. And I was thinking about um, David and Goliath. And, um, you know, I had, you know, we've always heard the story. He was this 13-year-old kid that went to meet his brothers. And he, he saw the, 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 the giants. And he had his sling. And he picked up the five stones so he could kill all of Goliath's brothers. But the thing that, you know, I just think, well, you know, it was just like coincidence. And it was just, just the fact that, you know, that he, it was God. And it was God. But the cool thing that I learned, which I thought was interesting, was David was a shepherd. And so he was completely trained in how to protect his flock. And so the sling in that day was a weapon of war. And it wasn't just this, you know, I, was think, I always think, yeah, he had this little bitty slingshot in his hand. And he was just like, you know. And, uh, but what it really was, was he, um, they were these big, I don't have, I wish I had one. If Shane had one, I would have borrowed it. <laughs> A long sling, and they would take it, and they, and they would put the stone in it, and they would sling it around and sling it around, and then they would go out. And, I mean, David killed lions and bears with, with that. And I just, I just think about that. And then, you know, the fact that it says in the, in the Word that, um, you know, he was trained with his sling. He, he, he killed the devil. He walked, I mean, the devil, Goliath was the devil. He walked over there, and he took his sword, stabbed it, and chopped his head off. So, you know, what 13-year-old does that, right? He was a trained warrior. And so I don't know about you, but I want to be a threat where it concerns my father and my king. And so we have to be trained so we can withstand, and then and only then are we effective against evil. So in 2 Timothy, so if you want to get your Bibles out, we're going to look at a lot of Scripture today, and it will also be on the board. But uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God will be, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we need to know our weapons. We need to know that the sword, it, it's, it's an offensive weapon. It demolishes strongholds of errors, lies, falsehoods. The Bible also says that the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Second Corinthians says, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war in the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting every imagination and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so I want to bring this out. It's really cool. I was going to, uh, like, I had thought maybe I would chop some watermelons or coconuts, and then I thought, well, I guess I could get some baby doll heads or something too, but Cameron was like, no. And uh, so uh, Shane let me, let me borrow uh, this, this sword and it's really cool. This is, there, there was two of them. This one's cool, so it, it's, it's a cross. You know, it's, it's grounded. But, um, oh, if I can stand up. I'm not, I'm not trained. So I did find that I was trying to figure out how you uh, take your stance. But this isn't that kind of sword. This is a two-handed sword, right? And you're, they would take it and just, anyway, it's kind of dangerous. Anyway, sorry, I'm good. Okay, so I'm going to put that up. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, scary, scary me with a thought. A sword. So Hebrews 4.12 refers to God's word. Sorry about that. As a sword. <laughs> and it says, For the word of God is alive and active, and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Cool? See the double edges? And it really is sharp. So again, the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Another translation is it judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And as you see, the sword was made that way, and Cameron and I were talking because I was like, well, I could just get a knife, but a knife, of course, girl stuff, is only sharp on one side. That's a sword. Y'all know that's sharp on both sides. But, um, it made it easier to, to penetrate and to cut every way it went. It, so every, any way it went, it was piercing and penetrating through. And that's the same way with the Word of God. 
It reaches our heart, the innermost part of who we are, and it brings our spirit alive. It exposes it. It reaches to that deep place in us where our, our, our motives and our feelings. So the sword of the spirit cuts that place in us where the soul and the spirit meet. I think that's a really cool statement where, where they meet. It penetrates between the joints and the marrow. And the, the, the writer here is given an analogy. He's saying it's like the, the joints and the marrow. So the joints are, the bone is really hard. And then that soft place in between, that tender, that living inner part of the bone. And so he's, he's just, that's like the soul and the spirit. But then the word of God is like a sword and it can cut through the hard bone. And it gets into that inner, soft part of the bone. And so, our soul is that dimension of our life that we are by nature. Cameron always teaches us it's our mind, our will, and our emotions. So our soul is the dimension of our life that we are by nature. But our spirit is the dimension of what we are by supernatural rebirth. So in John 3, 6, it says this. It says, That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So what that's saying is that humans can only reproduce human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So without the awakening or without being truly born again, we're walking in the natural rather than in the spiritual. And that's a big deal. And I, I, this saying, you'll probably heard me say it before, but when you're walking in the spirit, it's not that you need a miracle. When you're walking in the spirit, it's that you're totally expecting one. Amen? So again, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 2.14, and it says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but he considers them foolishness and can't even understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen? So the point there, I think it is, is that the Word, it reveals to us our true self, who we are. It exposes who we are and what we are. And it, it's the attitude of our heart. It discerns the intentions. So I think the question that, um, that this raises is, are we born of God and spiritually alive? Or are we deceiving ourselves and spiritually dead? Are our thoughts that we have, are they spiritual thoughts or are they just natural thoughts and intentions? Is there life in our bones? Or are we just skeletons? Is there spirit in us? Or is there only soul? And the word of God is the only thing that can pierce through us and reveal truly who we are. And there's nothing in the world that's hidden from his sight. There's nothing in us that's hidden from him. Before him, we're all naked and we're all exposed to him. And one day we're going to give account. In Psalms, yes, amen. In Psalms, David said, may the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. So it's about the weapons that God's given us, and we need to know what they are and how to use them. And the purpose of, of every weapon that God has given us is to make us strong and to make, make, send the devil running. 
That's, 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 that's what we're supposed to do. And so our weapons are our praise, the, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, the word. A weapon is lifting up your hands in praise, our, our prayer, our voices, our, um, our praises. We are his weapons. Just, just who we are. He created us to be that. Psalms 119 says that in my heart I store up your words so that I might not sin against you. So the more we know the word and the more we understand, it's useful and effective and we'll be able to stand against the enemy. And then another, we're going into another scripture. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said this. He said, do not assume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will include members of his own family. And I'm thinking, wow, that is in the word. What does that mean? What, what is he talking about? And what I think it means is that we're, are, we are to love Jesus even more than our family, but, but more than ourself. And we need, to, we need to do what the Spirit, what Jesus tells us to do. We don't need approval when the, word, when, the, when the Spirit is flowing through you and guiding you. You don't need approval from anywhere. And, and so I think what it's talking about is, is when people, be, be believers and non-believers, when people, the name of Jesus always cuts and it always divides. Yes, and it cuts through the lies that we believe. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God and Jesus is the word. This is a long scripture, but this is probably one of my favorite scriptures. We're going to read John 1. It says, In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through Him. And apart from Him, not one thing was created that had been created. Life was in Him, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness didn't overcome it. And there was a man named John who was sent from God. And he came as a witness to testify about the light, Jesus, so that all might believe through him. But he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be called children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and took up residence among us, and we observed his glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Love that scripture. So the word's truth, and... and and we have, the word is truth, but we've been listening to the lies of the enemy for far, far, far too long. Uh, something that I found, it, it was cool. So I, I just learned that um, ISIS doesn't call us Christians. I thought that was weird. They call us people of the cross. So they don't call us Christians. We are the people of the cross. And that just, I was just like, that is awesome, I think. I think it actually kind of amazes me that sometimes I think ISIS knows who we really are, sometimes even better than we do. James 2.19 says, if you, if you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, and you do well, but the demons also believe and shudder. 
but are you willing to but are you willing to recognize you foolish fellow that faith without works is useless and so i think the word of god um thinking about isis and the fact that they they call us the people of the cross i think that's really significant i think that's like huge if, if we got that james talks about to prove yourselves as doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror and for once he's looked at himself and gone away He's immediately forgotten what kind of, of person he was. And so the word of God tells us who we are. And so it's really a mirror of who God says that we are when we're looking in it. But so many times we are looking in it and we're, we're, we're staring at it and we're saying, this is who God says I am. I'm everything that God says I am. But then we walk away and we forget. So this morning, I want to remind you of who you are. You are absolutely every single thing that the Word of God says you are. And we've been believing the lies of the enemy for so long that we're stupid, that we're not good enough. The enemy just, he labels us with, with lies. Just, that's what he does. And I think sometimes, or I know sometimes from my personal experience, I know sometimes when we hear those lies long enough, and they just keep coming, we start to believe them. But I'm telling you this morning, I want you to know who you are. You are only who the Word of God says you are. You're not who people say you are. You're not who Facebook or social media says you are. You're definitely not who your past says you are. You're not even who your friends say you are. You're not who your enemies say you are. You're only who the Word of God says that you are. And I think that we've all in our lifetime at some point been around like a critical, a critical spirit or just negative people. And they, they do the bidding of the enemy in our lives through their words. They say things like, you can't do that. You'll never succeed. You all heard them. You don't have enough money. You don't have the looks. You're too old. You're too fat. You're too skinny. <sighs> Another question that, you know, I think that I have, for the enemy has thrown at me, do they know who you are? That's, that's, I think that that's, that's the one the enemy, all the time, do they know who you are? Do they, do, do people, do they know what you've done in your life? Do they really know who you are? The enemy tells us, he says, you're a liar. He tells us you're a thief. You're a drug addict. You're an alcoholic. You smoke cigarettes. You're an adulterer. He says, he says you'll never be able to do that thing. His, he's constantly yelling at us and, and just telling us, you, 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 you'll never. You can't. And, and yeah, sometimes, sometimes the enemy uses people with their words. And that's painful. The tongue has the power of life and death. And so my prayer is, <laughs> and our prayer needs to be, Lord, bridle my tongue. And we have to be so careful what comes out of our mouth because I don't want to be, and we should never want to be that person that stomped on that dream that God gave someone. We should never be that person that crushed a vision, a vision that was God-given. We have to watch our mouth. Sometimes we just need to shut up. We need to just be silent. We need to ask the Lord to just calm us down and hold that tongue. Because one day, we're going to be held account. I think this is really scary. One day, we're going to be held account for every single word that ever comes out of our mouth. God forgive me. The word of God can slash through it all. The devil's a liar. He's the father of lies. Lying is his language. That's all he knows. And he lies to us because, here's the thing, the devil lies to us because he is scared to death 
of who you're going to become if you're set free. The devil lies to you because if you're set free, man, he, he doesn't even want to go there. Because when you're set free, you're going to become mighty in the kingdom. I don't care who you are. I don't care what lies the enemy's thrown at you. If you believe that dream that God gave you, and if you see that vision that he's given you in your mind, and your spirit, if you see it and you step out on it in faith, the devil is scared to death of how you're going to affect the kingdom of the almighty God. And, and here's the, the, the reality, the other thing. God isn't concerned, like the enemy tells us, with who you were or what you've done or where you've been. He totally dealt with all that at the cross. That is like as far as the east is from west. That's gone. That is just lies, lies, lies. But what God is concerned about is who you're going to become through him. And, and when you believe who his word says you are, you're going to be set free. So the devil's concerned if you take up the sword of the Spirit. He's concerned if you train yourself and you learn how to use it. Because you then will send the enemy running. It's going to cut through every lie, every attack, every, everything that he can throw at you. And then you're going to become a threat to the enemy. So the last year of my life has been, I think it's been the hardest thing that I've, I know it has, it's been the hardest thing that I've ever had to go through in my life other than losing my brother. And I was scared. So I stand here today, and I'm scared to death to stand here and share with you, but I am so thankful for what the Lord has done. And I'm so thankful that I get to stand here, that I have the honor that, he, that he's using me. But I want you to remember that when you go through trials, as, as much as it doesn't seem like it, when you go through trials, God's making you stronger. And the, the cool thing is, is that, sorry, you will not be, I'm preaching to myself, <laughs> you will not be in that area of captivity in your life forever. But it's during those times that it's so hard, and you don't know how you're going to get through it. And you don't know what it's going to look like. You don't know what your new normal is going to be. But it's during those times of trials that God trains us. He's getting us ready for when we get out of that prison cell or that trial that we're in. And the enemy wants you to believe that, that it's never going to be any better. He wants you to believe that things are never going to change in your life. But God has a plan for you, and his plan is not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. Where the enemy thought he had won, where the enemy thought that he had destroyed you, God says no. No weapon formed against you, my child, will prosper. You are a child of the Most High God. And during those times of trials is when God is going to strengthen you. And so I say to the enemy today that when you mess with a child of God, you better watch out. Because you are defeated in every area. You can't win. Your lies are, are out the door. So we just say to the enemy, and, and, and I say to the enemy today, all you've done through your attacks on my life, all your lies have done, all the things that you have done to me, you better watch out because God is strengthening me. God is making us stronger. Amen? So what the enemy intended you to do to do to you, he's never going to succeed. And you know why? Because God is lifting you up. There's no weapon that can be formed against you that will ever prosper because God has his hand on you. 
In the last year, I remember um, the enemy telling me, I'm going to kill you. You're not going to make it through this. And I really believe that. And I was, I, I didn't even really tell anyone that. I, I may have told my mom, and, but I was terrified. But God's word kept coming to me. And he kept talking to me. So when the enemy says, I'm going to kill you, the word of God says, no, for you shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The enemy says that you're never going to be well, that you're never going to, you'll never, you'll never see, hear, you'll never be whole again. But the word of God says that by my stripes, you are healed. Say that, you are healed. The enemy says that you can't do that. You don't have what it takes. You'll never succeed. But the word of God says, for I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. The enemy lies to you and he says, you're never going to amount to anything. Who the heck do you think you are? You're not even good enough to do that. But this, I love this one. This, first Peter says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. And you're a holy nation. And you, and you, and you, and all of you, you are God's special possession that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The enemy sometimes says to you, you're a failure, and you're going to fail, and there's no future for you. But the word of God says it, for I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. The enemy says that you're not pretty enough you're too fat, you're too skinny, you don't have a look, you're not strong enough. But the word of God says, God knit you in your mother's womb, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The enemy says that God didn't love you, but the word says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So we're to take up our swords. We're to go out into a battle. We're to train ourselves in the word. We're to look in that mirror and be reminded of who we are so that when the enemy comes at us, because he will come, when he comes at you, you're going to be able to stand. We'll be ready. And we need to know our stance and we need to know it well so that we're prepared in that day. We have to rehearse our faith. We have to rehearse what we believe and what we declare and what the word of God says about us and what his word says out of our mouth all the time. You need to train yourself in that. You need to plant the word so deep in your innermost being and know what you're doing. And you need to take up your swords. Amen.